for discussion is survivorship and blood cancer. And for our discussion, we have with us Dr. Srinivas Chakravarti, Senior Consultant Hematologist and Medical Oncologist at Apollo Cancer Center, Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad. Dr. Srinivas Chakravarti is an American board certified senior consultant, medical oncologist and hematologist. He trained at Usmania University, University of California and at University of Washington. He has been a faculty and director of University of California, Davis Rideout Cancer Center in the USA. Welcome doctor to our FB live session. Thank you very much Pavani. Thank you very much all of you for being here with us. Starting with our question sir. Uh, what is blood cancer? How is blood cancer spread? Blood cancer, I think everybody remembers from school that blood has three types of cells. The white cells, red cells and the platelets. And blood cancer is cancers that come out of any one of these three kinds of cells or their precursors. That means their uh, previous, uh, 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 the cells which give rise to these three kinds of blood cells, either cancer comes from the precursor cells or cancer comes from one of these three lines of cells. That is what is called a blood cancer. Sir, so, what is the first stage of blood cancer? What are the symptoms? Have to see there is no one blood cancer. As I just said, blood cancer can, can come from any one of these three lines or at any point from the precursor cells of these three cell lines. So many different kinds of blood cancers. So broadly classifying... Okay. You put pause in the idea. But it's starting to start. Yeah, fine. <coughs> Hello? Can you put a summary? Yes, sure. Is it in there? It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's under me, then I compare. Under me, then I compare. Nina, present. She's actually post delivery for something. No. Correct. You only extra jobs. Davis Ride Out Cancer Center in the USA. Welcome, doctor, to our FB live session. Thank you very much. Starting with our question, sir, what is blood cancer, and what and how does it spread? I think everyone remembers from their high school, there are three kinds of cells in, in blood. Uh, the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. Now, blood cancers arise from any one of these three cells, or from their precursor cells. That means the parent cells which give rise to the three cells, either they come from the parent cells or from the actual blood cells themselves, that's called a blood cancer. By definition, because blood cancer, uh, blood goes all around the body, then by definition, blood cancer usually uh, spreads all over the body uh, in the blood itself. Sir, what are the symptoms? What are the common symptoms a uh, person should look out for? See, there's no one kind of blood cancer. There are actually many different kinds of blood cancers and uh, each one will have its own presentation, its own symptoms and how you deal with it and why it comes and so on and so forth. Uh, broadly classifying blood cancers, you can generally put them into the group of chronic leukemias, acute leukemias, um, lymphomas and uh, multiple myeloma. This is like multiple myeloma or myeloproliferative neoplasms. Now, each one will have its own. For example, in children, uh, the commonest blood cancer is ALL, what is called acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Um, in that, the common presentation is persistent bleeding. Either they bleed from the nose or the gums, from, or they get easy bruising on the body, or they have a persistent fever, or they feel weak and tired all the time. Any of these symptoms that last more than three weeks especially is cause for concern. They should see um, the uh, uh, doctor. Now, in adults, one common blood cancer in our, uh, in our country is what is called CML, chronic myeloid leukemia. 
chronic myeloid leukemia patients for example can present with what is called early satiety that means they eat a little bit of food and they feel full up very soon and they don't want to eat anymore and they start losing weight and their abdomen starts uh, swelling up because the spleen grows huge in size that's a very common presentation of CML so on and so forth you said uh, you, there are many types of blood cancer. Correct. There's chronic, there's lymphoma. Correct. Uh, what are the common di what a person should go for a common diagnosis? I mean, diagnostic centers to look out for. Commonly, we don't uh, see there is a concept of screening in cancers. I'm sure many people have heard about it. You hear of breast cancer screening. Uh, cervical cancer screening, prostate cancer screening, so on and so forth, colon cancer screening and so forth. Uh, screening is a uh, is procedure or a test where you check a perfectly healthy person to see if they have any hidden cancer in them. There is no such screening program available for any of the blood cancers as of today. Uh, nothing that's known to work. But what we do recommend is starting from the age uh, of 35 at least, People in this country need to be checked for what are called the non-communicable diseases. That's hypertension, cholesterol, diabetes. These are very common in the community. And we check routinely for those uh, once a year or two years anyway. Along with that, typically, you will also get a complete blood picture, a CBP. Typically, if anything has to show up early, it will show up on the CBP, whether you do it on children for some other reason or whether you do it for adults for routine screening purposes. Does cancer, blood cancer have stages in that? Some blood cancers do, some blood cancers don't. For example, acute leukemias, by definition, have already spread in the blood. They are born in the blood and they are spread in the blood. Uh, so there is no stage. So effectively, all acute leukemias are stage 4 at diagnosis. Uh, so we don't stage them. There's a very different system of classification for acute leukemias. Uh, these days, we're using what is called the genetic classification. That means we know that based on certain genetic mutations that occur in acute leukemias, uh, the way we treat it and the way the outcomes are and the cure rates are extremely different. So now we use more of a genetic classification in acute leukemias rather than the staging system. However, some cancers, let us say, for example, lymphoma. Uh, because lymphomas uh, typically, although there's a blood cancer, uh, remember, we all have normal lymph nodes in our body which are part of the blood system. Lymphomas typically affect the lymph nodes, spleen and organs like that. And lymphomas, we do stage them like other, ca like other solid cancers, like stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 and stage 4. Sir, so, um, blood cancers are genetic? If yes, what are the possible ways of finding it and avoiding it? See, this is a, this, this is a good question actually because this is... For, for odd reasons, we are just understanding the genetic basis of uh, blood cancers only in recent times. Uh, from one point of view, all cancers are genetic in the sense that every normal cell, uh, most of you are aware, divides when it has to divide and stops dividing when it doesn't have to divide. That's how we are born as small babies and we grow to a certain size and once we're about five feet, six feet or whatever, we stop growing. We don't stop growing further because most almost all normal cells in the body know when to divide and grow and when to stop growing. Now cancers in general occur. Cancer is a broad word. Uh, what you call a cancer is when any given cell loses its ability to stop dividing and it continues to continually divide and lives much longer than it's supposed to and then doesn't know when to divide. So that rapidly proliferating cells is what is the hallmark of any cancer, blood cancer or solid cancers. Uh, and these happens because of certain genetic mutations that happen in the breaking system or in the accelerating system of the ca cancer cell. That means that uh, there's a genetic mutation that causes the brakes to go wrong so it can't stop or the accelerator to go wrong so the accelerator gets stuck and the cancer cell starts dividing. So by definition actually all cancers are genetic but uh, majority, the vast majority of these genetic mutations are acquired, which means you're not born with them. They happen at random or because of certain chemical or exposures or certain uh, issues that happen as we grow up that can cause mutations in these crucial genes. Now the question you're asking me basically, what you're asking me is, is there a hereditary basis, hereditary genetic basis to blood cancers? Now that is an area that is being researched at this point in time. Yes, there are a few hereditary syndromes. That means certain gene mutations that you can inherit from your either one of your parents or both parents. 
which can increase the risk of having blood cancers. Some of the genes that we're looking at are what are called RUNX1, GATA, uh, CEBPA, so on and so forth. So these three are the most researched and several other genes that seem to be inherited and do call, increase the risk of blood cancer in those children uh, who inherit one of these mutant, mutated genes from their parents. Uh, but that seems to be a relative minority. So out of all these uh, blood cancers, what you have mentioned, which is the deadliest of them? You know, my favorite saying to everybody is life is deadly in and of itself. Everybody born dies, right? Mm, so that is dark humor for you. Uh, to rephrase that question, <clears throat> I suppose what you mean by deadly means, what is, this, what is the disease that can kill you the most rapidly if you don't treat it? So let's phrase the question this way, then you get an answer for that. Acute leukemias in general. <clears throat> So acute lymphoblastic leukemia, uh, more importantly certain kinds of acute myeloid leukemia, these are very deadly in the sense that if you do not treat them, typically death happens within three months of diagnosis. So leukemia affects your brain also? Yes it can. Certain kinds of leukemias can spread to the brain as well. So we have talked about symptoms, we have talked about types of uh, blood cancer. Uh, can you just brief us about the treatment part? Again, just as not all blood cancers are one and they're very different and the symptoms and the mutations and all are very different, treatments are also very different. Let us talk about acute leukemias because you mentioned them. We just said they're among the deadliest cancers because they can kill you very rapidly if you do not treat them. By the same corollary, it is important for everyone to remember that all acute leukemias are potentially curable. So while they are deadly if not treated, a lot of them can be cured completely uh, with modern treatment. So our topic is for survivorships. True. So uh, what should a cancer survivor avoid in his day-to-day -day life? What anybody else should avoid. Uh, they should avoid bad food. By bad I mean food that can be unhealthy in general uh, such as junk, deeply fried foods, high fat content foods and so forth. They should avoid uh, lethargy, they should avoid a sedentary lifestyle. That means they should be more active, they should get some sort of aerobic exercise at least for half an hour every day or every other day at the very minimum. Uh, they should take particular care to avoid infections in general. So they have to have routine hygienic practices which all of us should be doing but uh, cancer survivors, blood, especially blood cancer survivors should probably be doing it particularly like washing hands with soap after going to the bathroom, before eating food, making sure you eat, your food is covered and making sure you eat generally well cooked healthy food, uh, also avoiding people with coughs and colds, so on and so forth. We have a question from the audience, sir. how can I live a healthy life after surviving from blood cancer? I know you have covered that, along with that how long does it take for a, uh, after treatment to come back to a normal stage? That again depends on the particular kind of cancer that you had and the particular kind of treatment that you had for the cancer. Let us take the example again of acute leukemias because the treatment for acute leukemias is quite intense usually. It typically takes 6 months to 12 months for the body to come back to a complete steady state uh, after completion of treatment. Uh, so is cancer worse in the second time? Many of the, many of the patients have that fear in them. Correct. That means the question is, if the cancer comes back, is it worse? It can be. It's not necessarily true, but in some cancers it can be true. See what happens, again, let us take the example of acute leukemias, uh, or any cancer for that matter. Uh, you have to have approximately one crore cells before you actually detect it. Uh, that's how small cancer cells are. So what happens is by the time that a cancer is detected either by the blood picture or swollen lymph nodes or a swollen spleen or whatever it is, uh, there are crores and crores and crores of cancer cells in the body. And when we give treatment, whether that be chemotherapy or one of the more modern treatments we give, we end up killing a vast majority of these cells usually. 
Now, when the cancer cell count goes below one crore, typically, then uh, we say that the patient is in remission. So the word remission means, this is a common word, a lot of people have heard it, especially people with blood cancer. The word remission means that the cancer cells have become undetectable in your body by any one of the standard tests that we have. Now it does not mean that all cancer cells are gone because all these tests have a detection limit as we just said and typically it is one crore. There are modern tests, there are newer tests and there's a concept called minimal residual disease testing where we have more sensitive tests that can test for even fewer cancer cells but even those have a limit. So we use the word remission with cancer cells are under a certain limit and are no longer detectable. We use the word cure when you're gone, you're done well for 10 years, 15 years or more, and you've not had the cancer back, then we call, use the word cure, which means that pretty much all the cancer cells in your body are dead and they're not going to come back because the vast majority of blood cancers, if they are going to come back, they come back within the first two years or usually in the first five years. Beyond that, it's very, very unusual for the blood cancers, for at least the acute leukemias or the lymphomas to come back after that. Um, so what happens sometimes is even if there are a handful of cancer cells that become resistant to the treatment given to you the first time that means cancer cells remember also are evolving they are getting new mutations all the time they're rapidly dividing if they acquire certain mutations while you're be, they're being treated that allow them to become resistant to the existing treatment they will hide in your body and they can come back at a later point in time, they can grow back and become detectable at a later point in time and they can be a little bit more difficult to treat because they've already learned how to be resistant to the first round. So we have one more question from the audience. Who is at the risk of blood cancers? We don't know. <laughs> That's a simple answer. Um, as of today, it seems to be mostly random. That means it's just an accident that happens in some mutation at some crucial part of the we are we all as we as I sit and speak to you there are a lot of mutations happening in my own body in the dividing cells most of these mutations are meaningless that means they cause no harm but sometimes if a random mutation like that happens in some crucial part of a gene as we just discussed with the first question then that can lead that can cause that can that cell to become a cancer cell eventually however we know that probably there are some groups at higher risk of uh, blood cancer there is a strong suspicion that certain kinds of chemicals and commonly used pesticides can increase the risk of getting lymphomas so it's not unusual for us to see lymphomas from those areas that are agricultural and where the uh, the the patients have grown up in an agricultural background with a lot of pesticide contamination in their water and all that certain chemicals in water called nitrites also seem to increase the risk of having certain kinds of blood cancers uh, apart from that, we just discussed the fact that occasionally there are hereditary genes and there are certain hereditary syndromes that are inherited from the parents uh, that can also increase the risk of having blood cancer. Sir, so which is harder on the body? Is it chemo or radiation? Uh, hard is as hard as I guess that's a subjective question. Uh, Chemotherapy has its own set of side effects. Radiation can have its own set of side effects. So it depends on how the individual reacts to the given kind of radiation. Also given, it depends on the location to which radiation is given. It also depends on the kind of chemotherapy given because remember there are many, many different kinds of chemotherapy. So it is, it depends, it changes. Uh, the kind of side effects you have and the intensity of side effects you have changes from uh, situation to situation so there's no general rule that covers it all having said that I think it's very important to understand that in the modern era in this century uh, the radiation techniques have improved tremendously chemotherapy drugs have improved tremendously we have newer chemotherapy agents now and we're discovering newer ones as we sit and speak more and more research is happening to make these newer chemotherapy uh, drugs less toxic, have less side effects, and be more effective in certain given cancers. Uh, we have also improved significantly the supportive care treatment that we give. That means for many chemotherapies, we can predict like clockwork what are the side effects that are going to happen. And we now have newer drugs and newer techniques which can actually prevent such side effects from happening even before they do. Um, 
as far as radiation is concerned, the software revolution that happened in the late 20th century, early 21st century has affected radiation techniques too. So now we are able to give much more focused radiation onto the cancer uh, areas, onto the cancer fields and minimize side effects dramatically. We are also now in the era of uh, finding out how we can treat less for more. That means de-intensified treatment. There was a time when we had acute leukemia. The doctors were as scared as a patient and say, you know, this is acute leukemia. We got to save this child and throw everything at it. That means hit it with all we have got, uh, which gave some children at least unnecessary side effects. But now the era is we risk stratify. In other words, we understand. For example, a child comes with ALL. That just this is just an example. It applies to almost all cancers acute lymphoblastic leukemia. We now risk stratify. We have very low risk, low risk, high risk and so forth. And um, in the risk stratification, we de-intensify it. For the lower risk people who we expect a very high cure rate, we actually give lower intensity treatment where you can minimize the side effects and maximize the uh, good effects. So we have one more question from the audience. How long can blood cancer go undetected? Sometimes it can go for years. The commonest blood cancer around the world is what is called CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This typically affects elderly people. It can happen in anybody. It can happen in young adults also. Very, very rare in children and young adults. Very, very common in elderly. Now, CLL can go undetected for years and years even because it doesn't cause any symptoms. In the vast majority of people, it, does, it causes no swelling in the lymph nodes, no swelling in the spleen or, or anything like that. Typically, it is detected only when the blood test is done for some other reason. And then you find an excess of lymphocytes and they investigate and they find, okay, you have got CLL and you probably had it for many years. So cancers can maybe if they had did not have a blood test many of these people would actually live and die of old age and they would never know that they had CLL uh, from that extreme to certain cancers like AML or acute lymphoblastic leukemia uh, in which case blood cancers can go for some months typically before being detected so you're saying that it will develop it can develop in a year or two when we will not it can develop over 10 years, 20 years, and you may never know about it in the case of uh, cancers like CLL. But in cancers like acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, you will know very, fairly soon. One more question from the audience, sir. What type of foods, uh, I mean food, helps in lower red blood cells? When the red blood cells are lowered? Yes. Uh, in general, we're not talking cancer patients here, but in general, we're talking of people with low red blood cells, which is a condition called anemia. So in general, anemia is helped by food. It depends on the cause of anemia. The, the commonest cause of anemia is iron deficiency anemia. So in general, food that is rich in iron helps red blood cells, such as bone marrow, marrow soup, bone soup, uh, bone marrow, what in Hyderabad we call nahari paya, um, um, green leafy vegetables, cabbage, broccoli, peas, uh, uh, jaggery, so on and so forth. Some people, the cause is a deficiency of vitamins called B12 and folic acid. In that case, foods rich in B complex vitamins helps uh, them. Some people have a condition called thalassemia, uh, which is common in our country in certain belts, and they'll have low red blood cells. In such cases, iron should actually be avoided, not taken in excess. So iron-rich food should be decreased, not uh, completely stopped, but decreased. The, coming to cancers, many, treat, many of these blood cancers we just discussed cause low blood cells, low red blood cells also. In such cases, food is not going to help with the red blood cells. Treatment of the cancer is going to help the red blood cells. Quite often in blood cancer patients, when we treat it, treatment also can cause low red blood cells. In such cases, adjusting the doses of the treatment that we give, giving blood transfusions or giving certain special injections which will boost your red, red blood cell count, those things will help. Coming towards our last question, sir. Please tell us about the facilities provided at Apollo Hospital Jubilee Hills, Hyderabad. We are a quaternary care hospital here at Apollo Hospital Jubilee Hills and they are fully equipped. 
We here treat all kinds of blood cancers and we have a separate leukemia ward which is a very very important facility that most ca uh, hospitals actually do not have and this is very important because treating acute leukemias is a team sport and it requires very precision coordination, it requires extraordinary uh, care so that hospital acquired infections and all do not affect these patients and that their treatment can go smoothly. So having a dedicated team of nurses in a dedicated ward which is generally sealed off and protected as far as possible from infections is actually in a, a very important. Apart from that we do have newer equipment like extracorporeal phototherapy, uh, we do have a fully fledged BMT bone marrow transplant unit with the latest uh, modalities available and we have an excellent team of internationally trained doctors uh, who work together to cure these kinds of blood cancers. Dear viewers, we have come to our end, end of our session and hope we have covered all the aspects. If you still have more doubts, you can book an appointment with Dr. Srinivas Chakravarti and clarify your doubts. Thank you, Doctor, for educating our audience in today's session. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for such educative live sessions. Thank Namaste. you, Pavani. Namaste and thank you all.